If it's Monday, President Biden hitting the campaign trail and hitting former President Trump more aggressively than ever before, with a new ad calling him a convicted criminal and a stark new warning about the possible future of the Supreme Court. Plus, the Surgeon General's urgent call for Congress to require tobacco-style warning labels on social media, saying the mental health crisis among young people is an emergency. And Israel's prime minister dissolves his war cabinet amid divisions over the future of Gaza as the military announces it will pause some fighting near a critical border crossing to allow more humanitarian aid into Gaza. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Yamiche Alcindor in Washington as a major tone shift is happening right now in the presidential race. With just 10 days to go until the first presidential debate, the Biden campaign is heeding the advice of Democrats calling for him to go after former President Donald Trump more aggressively. Today, the campaign is out with a new ad directly calling Trump a convicted criminal and more. In the courtroom, we see Donald Trump for who he is. He's been convicted of 34 felonies, found liable for sexual assault, and he committed financial fraud. This election is between a convicted criminal who's only out for himself and a president who's fighting for your family. That new ad is part of a $50 million ad buy ahead of next week's debate, which will perhaps be Team Biden's best chance to shake up this race. The ad campaign is funded in part by President Biden's West Coast fundraising swing that included an event packed with celebrities Saturday night. The president laid out what he sees as the stakes for November's election in a conversation with former President Obama and comedian Jimmy Kimmel. The next president is likely to have two new Supreme Court nominees. Two more. Two more. He's already appointed two that have been very negative in terms of the rights of individuals. The Supreme Court has never been as out of kilter as it is today. I mean, never. When we said after the, after the, the decision that overruled Roe v. Wade, the Dobbs decision, you had Clarence Thomas talking about the fact that there are going to be other things we should reconsider, including and in vitro fertilization, including contraception, including all these things. And they're, they're, go, they're, and they're going, and by the way, se, by the way, gay rights. Marriage. But by the way, not on my watch. Not on my watch. There you go. President Biden there took a two-pronged jab at Trump. He warned about the potential dangers of a Trump, another Trump administration, specifically when it comes to the Supreme Court. He also leaned in on the issue Democrats think is their strongest, abortion and reproductive rights. And that comes as the Biden campaign is planning a major push to contrast President Biden's views on abortion with former President Trump's. Sources tell me that the campaign will hold more than 30 events to mobilize voters ahead of the second anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The push will feature Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, as well as a number of other big-name political surrogates and celebrities. Joining me now is our team of reporters. Mike Manley is at the White House. Von Hilliard has the latest from the Trump campaign. And Dasha Burns has the view from young voters as former President Trump appeals to a traditionally blue demographic. So thank you all for being here. Mike, I'm going to start with you. We knew that the Biden campaign was planning on getting more aggressive after the hush money trial. How do they feel this message is going and, and whether or not they and do they really think it's going to resonate here with voters? Well, Yamish, what the campaign has really been counting on all along is that voters will ultimately see this as a choice between Donald Trump, between Joe Biden, two very different men, two very different presidents. But during that trial, we saw more of a counter-programming strategy where they put the president out on the road talking about economic accomplishments, talking about his economic vision, with the hopes that when people saw those two different realities side by side, that they would see that contrast for themselves. But now they've gone from really shading Donald Donald Trump to putting a bright, huge $50 million spotlight on Donald Trump and his critical conviction, criminal conviction, putting that explicitly into this new ad campaign. And there's another reason for that as well, Yamish, because the other part of this has been hitting those low information voters and those voters who really were tuning out, who don't like either of the candidates. The criminal conviction is one of those moments that has happened in terms of breaking through the news cycle, breaking through into people's TikTok feeds, uh, those less informed viewers. And so the campaign now wants to capitalize on that 
jump on that and make that contrast. We were out on the road, uh, I was at that fundraiser, and there was definitely also a, a real effort on the part of President Obama during that fundraiser to play up President Biden's strong qualities, uh, his tenacity, his willingness to fight special interests, part of what we're going to continue to see in the run-up to the debate next week as the campaign really tries to drill down on this idea that Donald Trump is vo motivated by vengeance, motivated by his own interests, while, while President Biden is looking out for the average voter. It's interesting, as of course, as you describe the sort of contrast that they're making there in the Biden campaign, this is all coming on the heels of the Hunter Biden trial. Um, you spoke to the first lady, Jill Biden, who attended much of that trial. Um, she was there when Hunter was found guilty, holding his hand as he was leaving the court. What did she say to you about the impact Hunter's legal problems are having on the president as he campaigns? Well, it was just so striking, Amisha. I spent three days on the road crisscrossing the country with the first lady uh, starting last Thursday, which was literally the day after uh, she and her family had been together to process what that verdict meant. There was some question about whether it would take her off the trail, but she was really motivated to get out there quickly, and she said part of that was because of the strength of her son in the face of this verdict. Here's more of a, the conversation that she and I had this weekend. It was kind of hard uh, to go back and hear all that again, but we had to get, you know, we, here we are. We have to get back. We have to win this election, and so I think... Um, after the decision in the court, Hunter was strong. And um, so I have to take uh, his example and just get out there and start fighting again. Now, I also asked her, I said, is this going to affect your husband's preparation for the debate? There's some question about whether uh, all of this that the family has gone through might impact his ability to prepare for this perhaps one of the most important moments of the entire campaign. And she said, Mike, you've covered him a long time. He's resilient, he's strong, and he'll, he'll be there when the debate comes. Yeah, well, great getting that uh, exclusive interview with Jill Biden there. Vaughn, I want to come to you. The Biden campaign, as we said, is leaning into calling Donald Trump a convicted criminal. How is the Trump campaign taking to that? Right. In, in large part, it is not only not running away from the fact that he was convicted or the trial at large, but it is an effort to turn it on its head by calling it political persecution and conveying to the public, you know, those that could be almost surrogates in their own neighborhoods to a certain extent, why he was found guilty of the charges and the fact that these charges should have never been brought in the first place. And that is where I can tell you from traveling over the course of the last month since his uh, he was found guilty on those 34 felony counts, that some of his most loyal supporters effectively uh, are able to echo or parrot a great many of the defenses, self-defenses, that right there was a DOJ prosecutor that made its way, his way over to work for the district attorney's office, or that the judge Mershon's daughter was profiting through democratic politics over his prosecution. And folks go and reiterate these things in their communities. And that's why you saw Donald Trump over the course of his trial and since since then, not run away from the reality that he was found guilty or the fact that the trial happened. Instead, he has used it to wage this idea that all of this, not only this, but also being found to have engaged repeatedly in financial fraud through the Trump organizations or to have sexually abused and defamed E. Jean Carroll. Instead, he has openly and publicly talked about it, uh, even at campaign events, as a way of giving his most loyal supporters, uh, you know, good talking points to go out in their communities and make the case to, you know, among their family and their friends as to why they should ignore these realities and the fact that he's a convicted felon and still vote for him this November. And that messaging that you're talking about, it's really helped in some ways the Trump campaign kick up its fundraising since the verdict. But I wonder, can the Trump campaign really compete with this latest $50 million ad buy from the Biden campaign? Look, they, I mean, they raised more than $100 million, Yamish, after the conviction. And not only through the actual campaign apparatus of the RNC, but also the super PAC. Well, of course, we're waiting for the exact figures to see how it stacks up against the Biden campaign. But for, you know, the Trump operation, this was a cash influx that they needed here and one that they're going to need to uh, increase even more over the course of this summer. Uh, that is also why you saw Speaker Johnson down at Mar-a-Lago again here today, along with the RNC 
Pence uh, NRCC chair, because it's not just the White House uh, uh, that is on the line, but it's also the majority in the U.S. House. And Speaker Johnson is where that they have a razor thin majority. And he spent the last hours with Donald Trump because it is in the interest of both men, mutual interests, to have victories in November, because it'll, the White House only does so much good come January 2025 if they don't have the House and a Speaker Johnson to begin to push through some of that legislation. And Dasha, I want to bring you in because there, as, as Vaughn is sort of talking about what the Trump campaign is doing, it was also the Trump campaign spending a lot of time this weekend courting black voters, also courting young voters. What did you were, at, of course, at this weekend at the turning point? What did you hear specifically about young voters? Well, look, polling data has shown there is a tightening race between Trump and Biden when it comes to Gen Z voters in particular. And the Trump campaign is taking notice. They're taking steps like getting on TikTok after the former president was initially critical of the platform. He's been advocating in favor of cryptocurrencies. Uh, he's also become uh, close to Charlie Kirk, who is sort of a right wing provocateur that is the founder of Turning Point. That's the organization that hosted the event this week and the former president has attended a few uh, of, of Turning Point's events. And, and look, when it comes to that, that tightening between uh, Trump and Biden and Gen Z, it is specifically uh, young men that are starting to uh, shift rightward, uh, Yamish. And Kirk's advice to the former president, he does have his ear on this stuff. He told me that he, he's advising him to do more on TikTok, to do, uh, go to more UFC fights, to uh, talk more about crypto, also to talk about housing costs to talk about uh, declining marriage and fertility rates, that he believes those are the kinds of things that are going to help bring uh, young voters, particularly young men, into uh, the conservative tent. Certainly quite the list of topics he wants Trump to be focused on. You also spoke with Turning Point's founder, Charlie Kirk, who weighed in on Trump's veep stakes. What did he say there? And how much do we really think Trump cares about what Turning Point's view is on when it comes to the VP and sort of the way forward? Well, Charlie Kirk has grown increasingly close to the former president, especially his family. They've come to his defense when he has uh, had different sort of controversies in the headlines. And so uh, he does have Trump's ear on certain topics. And here's what he told me about the beef steaks. You mentioned yes. J.D. Vance. Who do you want to see as J.D. Vance. Okay. J.D. Vance That's is my man. Yeah. That's pretty straightforward. He is, uh, he is amazing. He is the only veteran in contention. He's wicked smart. I'm biased because he's a friend and he's so sweet and just awesome. And we need to win a Rust Belt state. And JD is the only person in the final three, Rubio, Burgum, JD Vance, that uh, is a popular elected official in the blue wall. And he's also under the age of 40, so get help with younger voters. So I'm on Team Vance. JD Vance, of course, also has the support of the former president's son, Don Jr., Yamish. Interesting there. Now, Mike, I want to come back to you because as Dasha is talking about sort of the appeal to young voters that's happening in the Trump campaign, there's also the Biden campaign. And as you reported last week, the Biden team is really trying to reach out to older voters here. So I wonder what's going on there and how does that go against sort of conventional electoral wisdom? Yeah, and I really saw this in action over the weekend as uh, the First Lady was holding these Seniors for Biden events in all the battleground states. These were well-attended events. There was one in a bingo hall. I'm told that they were playing Biden bingo before the First Lady arrived. And if Biden were to continue the trend that uh, it began in the 2020 election when he came just a few points short of Donald Trump among seniors. He would be the first Democrat to win senior voters since Al Gore in 2000. And it was so fascinating as the first lady was campaigning this week and she took this age issue head on. She said that her husband has not been the, one of the most successful administrations in history, as she put it. Be in spite of his age, but because of his age. She said people uh, underestimate seniors' ability at their own peril. And she talked about her husband being healthy, 81-year-old, ready to continue to work on behalf of the American people. So there's an element of this which is leaning into what they have seen in the polling as a potential advantage and playing to that advantage, but at the same time trying to neutralize or at least play defense on what is certainly a top concern among voters about whether the president at 81 is still fit to do the job. Well, certainly a lot to talk about and a lot that we'll be covering as this debate gets closer and closer. Thank you so much to all of you. And coming up, why the U.S. Surgeon General is calling for tobacco-style warning labels to appear on social media platforms and how Congress is responding. 
Plus, Russian President Vladimir Putin announces a rare trip to North Korea tomorrow as the two nuclear powers look to deepen their alliance against the West. We're live with a report from Kyiv ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The U.S. Surgeon General, Vec Murthy, is calling for action to address what he says is an emergency mental health crisis among young people. He is proposing treating the danger of social media like the danger of using tobacco. In a New York Times op-ed, the Surgeon General calls on Congress to require a warning label on social media platforms. The label would be similar to the one seen on tobacco products. Murthy acknowledges that a warning label alone is not a fix, but he says social media is associated with a significant mental health, with significant mental health harms for adolescents. Not only have companies not demonstrated that their platforms are safe for kids, but there is growing evidence of harm. It, it shows us, in fact, that when adolescents spend more than three hours a day on social media, we are seeing an association with a doubling of risk of anxiety and depression symptoms, and the average amount of use per day among adolescents is nearly five hours. So that's deeply concerning to me, not just as Surgeon General, but as a parent myself. And U.S. teens spend an average of 4.8 hours a day using popular social media apps, according to the American Psychological Association. More than a third of teens, 37 percent, say they spend more than five hours a day using social media. And according to a Surgeon General's advisory on social media and youth mental health, 46 percent of kids between the ages of 13 and 17 say social media makes them feel worse about their body image. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson joins me now. So, Ann, this is really in some ways a, a real warning from the Surgeon General here. Mm -hmm. From a practical standpoint, though, how would social media put warning labels on their content? You know, Yamish, that's something we've been talking about all day, and nobody is quite sure how this is, how this would work if Congress would enact it, and that's what it would take. Um, would it? Would there be a warning every time you 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 know you went into the app? Would it be just once when you downloaded the app? Nobody's quite sure. But what the Surgeon General is trying to do here are two things. First of all, he's hoping that by just even raising this issue in the possible possibility of this kind of warning, you would increase awareness. And then the second thing he wants to do is that if this warning is enacted, is to change behavior. And that's the real key here. So that kids spend less time on social media. It's not that they have to leave it all together. It just ne they need to spend less time in large part, you mean, not only because of the mental health effects, but also because their, bl their brains are still developing in their teenage years. And those two combined issues is what why the Surgeon General is so concerned about the use of social media. It's really important, as you mark, that it's really their brains are still developing. With that being said, I wonder what the response has been from social media companies. It, it, at this point, has been quite muted. Um, Facebook, excuse me, Meta, which is the parent company of Facebook, has pointed out that they have urged um, Congress to enact some legislation that would require parents to give permission to their children to download apps if they were under the age of 16. That has gone nowhere. Now, most, most, most social media sites require that you be at least 13 years old in order to download the app, but there's really no enforcement there. So the question is, how good is that? And Meta also points out that, look, social media sites do some good. Uh, they point to the fact that a majority of kids say they feel more connected when they use social media. I can tell you on the other side, the American Association of Psychologists says near there's been a 40 seven percent increase in suicidal thoughts among teens so you've got people using data to fit their needs yeah yeah well you can see that the surgeon general is really concerned about this so thank you so much for all that reporting Anne. and we're going to speak to a member of congress about this issue later on this hour up next israeli prime minister benjamin netanyahu tries to distance himself from his own military's decision to temporarily pause some fighting in southern gaza to increase the flow of humanitarian aid An up close look at the effort to get aid into gaza next you're watching meet the press now
Welcome back. Today, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced a shakeup in Israel's government as he moved to dissolve his war cabinet. That group of advisors came together in the aftermath of the October 7th Hamas attack. But in recent days, two moderate members, including opposition leader Benny Gatz, resigned from that cabinet over disagreements about Israel's military strategy in Gaza. And right now, demonstrators are protesting outside of Netanyahu's home, calling for new elections in Israel. It comes as Netanyahu appeared, at least for a moment, at odds with his military over daily tactical pauses in southern Gaza. The IDF says the 11-hour-a-day pauses will allow humanitarian aid to come through a key border crossing. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley was at that border crossing and filed this report. This is among the hundreds of trucks that the Israelis say are now going to be able to move freely into the Gaza Strip to distribute this much-needed food aid. Now, this is the third day of a tactical pause, which is only going to be during daylight hours for 11 hours a day, starting from here, the Karam Shalom crossing. On the other side, you can see all the ramparts that stand in the way between us and the Gaza Strip. And it's going to open up a roadway uh, only about 10 kilometers into the Gaza Strip. This will allow for humanitarian aid to move further in and it will allow for greater distribution. This, according to the Israeli Defense Forces. Now, this has kind of landed with a thud on the Israeli side. The Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, according to Israeli media, called this unacceptable. But when he turned to his generals, they explained it to him. He did seem to accept the terms. Uh, and a, a, we apparently heard that even the Minister of Defense uh, Yoav Gallant hadn't really heard about this decision either. And right-wing politicians have condemned this. We heard from Itamar Ben-Gavir, the Minister of National Security. He said that this was a foolish decision, that whoever made it shouldn't be in their position. But it comes at a very critical time for the people of the Gaza Strip. We heard from the World Health Organization last week. They said that parts of the Gaza Strip are now facing malnutrition and hunger on a catastrophic level. Getting food aid into the Gaza Strip is a good first start. But Gazans are saying that the Israelis and the Egyptians should open the Rafah border crossing, which will allow more food aid in, and that they should be helping by limiting the fighting inside the Gaza Strip. It's the combat that is making this food aid so difficult to deliver. Matt Bradley, thank you so much for that key reporting from that border crossing. Let me now bring in NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons, who is in Beirut. So, Keir, as we mentioned, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dissolved his war cabinet today. What does that mean for the trajectory of Israel's military strategy in this war? And how is this announcement being received in the region? Well, I'm in Beirut, uh, in Lebanon, so obviously I'm not in Israel. Um, and, but in terms of how it's being received, Look, I mean, I think that the perception is that there is a good deal of division within the Israeli government. Uh, I think that this is going to just underscore that. It comes after Benny Gantz, the uh, more uh, mainstream, uh, middle of the road, if you like, politician, uh, left that uh, war cabinet eight days ago. The announcement by Prime Minister Netanyahu was expected. Um, it was something that he was expected to do, uh, not least because others who might have joined that um, war cabinet are some of the extreme right members of his uh, government that uh, Matt Bradley mentioned in his report uh, just a, a moment ago. Now, that would not have gone down well in Washington. So instead, there is no longer a war cabinet. There's what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu calls a kitchen cabinet, which I think is, uh, you know, kind of a familiar, opaque way of governing, uh, familiar to Israelis and others, obviously, in, in many other parts of the world. Uh, but then there is also uh, the, a, a wider security group uh, and 14 people, uh, 14 members of the government, and, and they will make the decisions. I mean, that was the situation before October 7th. The war, the war cabinet was, was really put in place after then. And so what Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying is it kind of brings Israel back to that more natural form of, uh, of, of government. Yeah. And you're in Beirut as clashes continue along the Israel-Lebanon border. Now, the White House sent a senior advisor to Israel today. Right. What more do we know about those meetings and how serious are the concerns about this thing escalating here? Well, I think the fact that uh, 
President Biden's senior advisor is in the region indicates that there is real concern in Washington and, and he's in Israel and he will come here uh, to Lebanon just for a, a short trip. I mean, I think that's a sign that the U.S. definitely wants to de-escalate uh, the, the tension along the border, the, the Israel's northern border, Lebanon's southern border here. Those clashes between uh, the Israelis and Hezbollah, that Iranian affiliated group that dominates Lebanon, uh, those are very worrying because of the way that they could escalate last week. A Hezbollah commander was, was killed. That led to serious conf, uh, clashes between the, uh, the Israelis and, and Hezbollah along that, that border. That, that tension is uh, diffused a little bit, but the real concern with all this is uh, that his Hezbollah being uh, aligned with Iran, that a, a bigger war here could uh, lead to Iran being pulled in, therefore uh, lead to the U.S. being pulled in. Uh, and that's not even uh, talking about the potential serious refugee crisis that would uh, impact uh, Europe. Uh, so uh, there's definitely a push to try to prevent that. Yeah, well, a lot of questions as we continue to follow all this. Thank you so much, Keir Simmons. And turning now to another global hotspot, the ongoing war in Ukraine. Right now, President Biden is meeting with NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg at the White House. The two leaders are expected to focus much of that conversation on their continued support for Ukraine. That all comes on the heels of the Ukraine peace summit in Switzerland over the weekend. Now, more than two and a half years into the war, President Zelensky urged the international gathering to forge a path forward for a just peace for Ukraine. Zelensky also met with Vice President Kamala Harris, who reiterated the administration's support for Ukraine and said it was unwavering. Now, joining me now is Richard Ingle, who's on the ground in Kyiv. Uh, so, Richard, obviously, President Putin is, was not invited to the peace summit in Switzerland over the weekend. So what was President Zelensky really hoping to get out of this gathering? So this wasn't a peace conference like you would think that two rivals or enemies would sit down and hash out some sort of agreement. Uh, these weren't peace talks. This was a summit about peace. And that's why it was Zelensky's and supporters of Ukraine trying to shore him up, give him confidence, show to the world that there is a united coalition around Ukraine and allow them to come up with what they're describing as some uh, honorable peace, uh, not a, not just a surrender, but a, a pathway to what they hope to be a, a, a sustainable peace. Uh, this is a very different position than we were in uh, two years ago when there wasn't even, even talk about uh, this process. There was maybe a, a talk about stopping the tensions or preventing bloodshed or trying to save the Ukrainian government. Now they are looking at a potential next phase of the moon, but the, Vladimir Putin made his peace proposal. He said, OK, you want uh, Russia to stop attacking? Then just hand over four provinces in this country, plus Crimea, including large areas that, that Ro Russia doesn't occupy. And this was Ukraine's response. This was Ukraine surrounded by the United States, flesh, uh, fresh with $50 billion in, in interest off frozen Russian assets, fresh off uh, $60 billion from Congress, a new 10-year pact that signed with President Biden, the Ukraine trying to show confidence before it even engaging in any kind of peace talks to say that it is coming in and try and show that it is coming in from a position of strength. Yeah, and as we, as we talk about President Putin, there's also, of course, this news that he'll be making a two-day visit to North Korea beginning tomorrow. It's the first time he's going to go to North Korea in two decades. What will be the focus of those meetings, and how concerned should Americans and really the West overall be about this deepening relationship between Russia and North Korea? It's all about weapons, uh, about artillery in particular. Uh, North Korea wants a lot from Russia. North Korea is, is a pariah state. It has a poor economy. It doesn't produce very much uh, of anything. It wants recognition. It needs currency. It needs food. It needs help with its intercontinental ballistic missile program, uh, missiles that can reach the United States and carry uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, that is what they, they are trying to do. And Russia has great experience uh, in this sector. Last time, uh, Kim Jong-un, went to Russia. This time it's Putin going to North Korea. And when Kim Jong-un went to Russia nine months ago, he visited uh, all of the sort of missile factories and munitions factories and places of, of high technology in Russia, because this is something that, that he hopes that he can get from Russia. But what Russia wants from North Korea 
is stockpiles of artillery shells, and it has a lot of them. Yeah. Well, interesting and definitely a, a meeting we'll be watching. So thank you so much, Richard, for all your reporting. And after the break, bad blood Republican Bob Good is fighting for his political life as both former President Donald Trump and former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are backing his opponent ahead of tomorrow's primary. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. The first stop on former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's so-called revenge tour didn't go as planned, with Congresswoman Nancy Mace claiming primary victory in South Carolina last week. Tomorrow is McCarthy's next opportunity to unseat one of the House Republicans who voted to oust him just last year. And McCarthy isn't the only one out for revenge against Virginia Congressman Bob Good. NBC's Ali Vitale took a trip to Virginia's 5th District ahead of tomorrow's primary. After years of Bob Good poking his party's powerful, the power brokers are punching back. Yeah, this is the Kevin McCarthy revenge tour. The man who leads the rabble-rousing House Freedom Caucus faces a tough primary challenge in Virginia's ruby red 5th Congressional District. The speaker said on a news show after last week, he said, well, the race we're really looking to is this Tuesday. This is the race. Good voted to oust former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Good of Virginia. Yay. Now, McCarthy's backing his opponent, John McGuire, as the former speaker's so-called revenge tour rolls on in search of its first victory. If you're on the Republican team and you're part of the Democrat team to take out the Republican team, you're not on the Republican team. Bob is on the Bob Good team. McCarthy giving McGuire a boost in cash and morale. I mean, advice, like, sure. hey, am I doing the right thing? And he's like, keep charging. Sure. More of a pep talk kind of a thing. McCarthy-aligned group shelling out $6.9 to blanket the airwaves against Good. Bob Good is bad for Virginia and bad for the USA. Both Congressman Good and McGuire, a state senator and former Navy SEAL, share an ultra-conservative stance on most issues. Good repeated Trump's false claims and voted not to certify the 2020 election. McGuire went to a Stop the Steal rally and was outside the Capitol on January 6th. We felt like we were, we were being cheated. If you get elected to Congress, you will be there for the next certification. Can you guarantee that you'll certify the results, no matter who wins? Well, you know, it's kind of hard to say. You have to see what happens. I mean, but isn't fundamental trust in American democracy? That's the problem. That's one of the reasons I'm running. McGuire also has former President Trump's backing. Everyone needs to get out and vote for John McGuire. Yeah, I've had many people say, I don't know anything about you. I've never met you before, but if Trump's endorsing you, I've got you. The endorsement? payback for Good's backing of Ron DeSantis in 2023. I'm sure the president will be supporting me on June 19 after we win. That's if Good's theory of the race doesn't go bad. People in Washington have no idea uh, what the people in the 5th District want. So what you're saying is no one cares about Kevin McCarthy. Nobody cares about Kevin McCarthy. At NBC's Ali Vitale joins me now. Great piece, Ali. Uh, so, you. especially that last bite there. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you, how much should we view tomorrow's race as really Kevin McCarthy's revenge tour or Donald Trump's endorsement power? It's both, Yamish, because Kevin McCarthy, of course, has been on this last week in South Carolina's first congressional district. This week, he's been vocal. And of course, we learned in that piece, talking to the challenger in Virginia's fifth congressional district, this challenge against Congressman Bob Good. So certainly, McCarthy's goals are at play here. But what he has in his favor this time is that he's not working against the endorsement of former President Trump. McCarthy and Trump are now on the same team in Virginia's fifth. And that could be the thing that puts Bob Good on the outs and John McGuire in Congress come January. Of course, there are a lot of other players in this race, too, and I'm not just talking about the outside groups, but we've seen a rare influx of people from this very building going out and either working in favor of Bob Good. For example, when we were with him on Friday, we saw several members of the Freedom Caucus out there campaigning with him, but we've seen just as many members go out to the district and campaign for the challenger, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has no love lost with Congressman Bob Good, but also some other members of the rank and file who just don't like the role that Good has played, both as someone who's part of the vacate eight, that's what Good has termed them, the people who voted against Kevin McCarthy last year, but they also don't like the way that he's acted as a colleague. Certainly personal is politics in this sense, but it's really rare to see lawmakers get involved in primary challenges against their own colleagues. And Yamish, 
One endorsement really struck me over the weekend. It was from a congressman within the House Freedom Caucus, Warren Davidson. This is a group that rarely endorses outside its own ranks. So no matter what happens, a long tail here, and there will be consequences and conversation here in Congress, regardless of what happens tomorrow night. It is fascinating to see all of these members of Congress weigh in here, and especially for yeah. House Freedom Caucus chair. So thank you so much, Ali Vitale, uh, for all of your reporting. You got it. And joining me now is our panel, Benji Starlin. It's Washington Bureau Chief for Summer 4, Democratic strategist and NBC News political analyst, Juanita Tolliver. And we also have Mark Lauder, former communications director for Donald Trump's 2020 campaign. So thank you all for being here. Benji, I want to start with you. Kevin McCarthy failed the last time he tried to get someone unseated here with Nancy Mace continuing to, to, to win in her primary. Do you think it's going to be enough now because both you see both Trump and Kevin McCarthy on the same team? That's the long and short of it. We've seen people survive without one of these bases of power, but to have both against you, extremely difficult, especially as the base of power for the House Freedom Caucus used to be this very specific ideological kind of Tea Party movement of people who were believed that they should have a very narrow, specific interpretation of conservatism. Trump is much more the validator for those conservative voters now. It's not clear how many voters are sitting around saying, well, I'll check the heritage score on Bob Good, and that'll determine if I, you know, how I decide between these. I don't think it's that many people. And, and Mark, as, as we laugh about this, I wonder if it really just boils down to now who has Trump's backing, because there aren't, as Ali pointed out, that many actual policy difference between these two candidates. Well, I think it's obviously you want the former president's endorsement, but what Kevin McCarthy also brought was $7 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something in a, in a primary, in a congressional primary, cannot be undercounted, because that money is a lot for a primary race. Look, it, it, whoever wins is going to be the next congressperson. It's a ruby red district. Uh, so this is where the fight is. And $7 million is, uh, that's a lot of money in a, in a congressional I also primary. want to emphasize that number because they are fighting, right? Like, I, just the fact that you have MAGA Republicans who are largely aligned on so many things, minus one, one misstep in Trump's mind as far as good supporting DeSantis for however many months he was in the presidential primary, that was enough to do it. Yeah. And so what I'm looking at is how long will this fracture last? Will those Republicans come back together and how will they come back together? As a lot of voters are debating, yes, good was a traitor for, for Alston Kevin McCarthy versus good showed he had a backbone, which is something that's lacking within the Although Republicans. Although I do think yeah. to, to that Ali's reporting showed that there was a lot of personal interplay from the come way on, he conducted yeah. himself <laughs> on Capitol Hill that added to it. It's there, not just yeah. a misstep here or there. There was a little detail there. I want to, I want to stick with you here when you think about Capitol Hill. Um, what's your reaction to the National Defense Authorization, uh, of the, the fight, that the act here, when you think about sort of Republicans and Democrats fighting over this, Schumer saying that they're not going to pass the House version of this? I feel like this is a f not even a fight because only one side is doing this, the same as they did last year. De Democrats even apparently went behind the scenes to Republicans and say, hey, can we avoid the theatrics? And they said, absolutely not. We want to show how anti-LGBTQ, anti-abortion, anti-diversity and equity we are. And so I appreciate Representative Raskin pointing out how they are really abusing their power and posture to use this defense authorization bill as a place to really air their issues or, or give them a platform. And Mark, do Republicans really want to hold this up and hold up maybe even a military bill, really, um, over issues and, and, and arguments over abortion and well, IVF? When it, when, it comes to, when it comes to the Hyde Amendment, I mean, that's been the law of the land for over 50 plus years. And all of a sudden, the Democrats and went back, were, back channel to get the Pentagon to do this, where the federal government is basically now subsidizing abortion in the military. And this NDAA amendment is basically saying, no, let's stick with the policy we have had for 50 years. The federal government does not use taxpayers to pay for abortion. Yeah. Benji, you're a policy guy. In a new study I want to I want to read, says that Donald Trump's plan to make tips um, tax exempt could cost tens of billions of dollars. He also suggested eliminating the income tax here. I wonder, when you think about sort of these policies, are they going to impact inflation in some way here? Uh, quite a bit, potentially. So one thing that's often been talked about with Trump's policy is, is that he's benefited tremendously from voters being upset with inflation. But there's not really a clear theory of what is causing inflation from Donald Trump. If you buy what most of the conservative critiques are, for example, the House Freedom Caucus, they would tell you it's overspending. 
But Trump wants to extend his tax cuts, expand the tax cuts, uh, potentially even lower the corporate uh, tax rate, and also apply new tariffs, which would raise the cost of imports, which would raise the cost of goods you pay for. So all of these things, if you pretty much accept their premise, again, the conservative premise of why we've had inflation, would make the problem worse. Now, how many of these things actually pass? I don't know. I, I don't think the income tax is disappearing in favor of import taxes any time. But the next president will have extremely broad latitude to set tax policy, especially if they have unified control of government. I wonder, do you think that we're going to get into a, a part of this race where you're going to see more scrutiny over these policies? Because right now we're arguing over who's calling who sort of a convicted felon. But as we get closer to the election and a debate, do we think these policy issues might resonate more with voters? It's tough to say. I mean, we're covering the heck out of them at semaphore.com. You should definitely read about it. But, but a nice plug. does that mean that's what drives voters? I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, how many Trump elections have really been a referendum on? I put out this very specific exactly. policy set of policy planks. I don't really think many. I'm shaking my head no the entire way because we know silly season is going to happen in the fall. I think what we're getting right now with this new Biden ad, for example, where he is calling Trump a convicted felon and laying out all of his other attributes, if you well, that appeals to Republican voters, um, but our, a huge turnoff to Democrats is laying the foundation for the contrast, especially ahead of the first debate. And Mark, I want to get back to you and ask you about this sort of the policy initiatives that, that Trump is talking about here. Are the Republicans really going to back some of the things he's talking about? Oh, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of support for many of these policies, but the number one thing is lowering the prices, lowering inflation, like you said. And President Trump's been very clear, and it's very easy. The first thing we've got to do is get control of our own energy again, because whether it's from the farm to the factory, the warehouse to your house, it requires fuel and energy. And because of Joe Biden's war on American energy, prices are through the roof. Those prices are being passed along to consumers. So the easiest and quickest thing he can do is to start to bring back American energy dominance, and that will show up not only at the pump, but it will show up in the grocery store and other places. But there are some economists that are pointing out that if, at least on the, on the tax exemptions and the tariffs, that if that was to go into place, that you would see inflation go up, you would see costs go up. So cause would Republicans well, and the president, or former president, do that? There were a lot. There were a lot of economists that predicted that the tariffs under the Trump administration were going to raise inflation, and they didn't do it because many companies absorbed it, and or China was forced to lower costs to offset those tariffs. So we can deal with it. And, and the key on the tariffs is that if you want to do free trade, it's got to be reciprocal or we're going we're gonna to fight for American workers. But we're not talking about targeted tariffs. We're talking about a 10% global tariff. I mean, Biden has continued some of the tariffs that Trump put in. Those are much more targeted. Uh, well, Anita, I want to ask you one last question here, which is there's this, of course, you, you brought it up, the conviction, the convicted felon messaging. Mm -hmm. um, we look at some pollings, and there's some from Politico, some from, from the political Ipsos poll that show that voters really aren't changing their minds about supporting Donald Trump after this conviction. So is this the best card for President Biden to be playing against Trump? I think it's the card right now, right? Like, I think that message is going to evolve. And as Biden, the Biden campaign comes out with additional material, and let's be real, there's no shortage of material from Donald Trump being on the campaign trail. Every, every week, every day, there's something else yeah. for them to amplify around the frame that he is unfit to serve in the Oval Office. I think this morning, one of the things was about him calling for the execution of leakers who worked in the White House staff, right? Like, there is more that's going to come forward and that the Biden campaign is going to be able to leverage. Yeah. We have to leave it there, but I would talk to y'all for a lot longer <laughs> <laughs> Good. So thank you so much, Benji, Juanita, Mark. I appreciate it. And up next, Democratic Congressman Jake Auchincloss joins me on how Congress will respond to the Surgeon General's urgent call for action on the dangers of social media. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we've, as we've said, the U.S. Surgeon General is calling on Congress to require social media companies to include tobacco-like warning labels on their platforms. Condemnation of social media companies has been one issue that has garnered bipartisan support on Capitol Hill, but that consensus has not necessarily translated into legislative action on the issue. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman from Massachusetts, Jake Auchincloss. Earlier this year, he introduced legislation to strengthen online privacy protections for children. So thank you so much for being here, Congressman. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. Hey, right. well, I want to get your reaction to the Surgeon General here. Do you believe a tobacco-style warning label will help protect children on these social media platforms? Yes. I think the Surgeon General makes a cogent and compelling case 
for the warnings. And he also elucidates why we need much more comprehensive regulation of these social media platforms, which have evaded congressional action for the entirety of their existence. And as they have become the most wealthy, the most powerful corporations in human history. It was a timely op-ed right after Father's Day. I'm a young dad, three little kids at home, and I feel like I'm in a race to regulate social media before my oldest kid can start scrolling because we know what it does to adolescent brains, and we know what it does to their socio-emotional development, and we know that these social media corporations are profiting off of the attention spans of our youth. Time for Congress to act. And I wonder, do you think it's fair, as you as you try to race to, to regulate this, do you think it's fair to compare teen social media use with smoking decades ago? Yes, in that it is a public health emergency that is crystallizing as the evidence becomes uh, more and more irrefutable. Now, are there differences between the two? Obviously, there are. The Surgeon General is leaning into a uh, an analogy that the American public will find resonant. What is clear, though, is that Congress needs to act and that these social media corporations need to be accountable. So what does that look like? First of all, it looks like raising the age of Internet adulthood. Right now, when you are 13 years old, you're an adult online. Facebook, Instagram, Discord, Reddit, they can treat a 13-year-old as a full-fledged adult. When I tell parents that in my district, they are flabbergasted. That's clearly ridiculous. Needs to be at least 16 years old. We have to help restore the play-based childhood from the grips of the phone-based childhood, and raising the age is an important way to do that. But the second thing we have to do is stop giving these social media corporations immunity from liability. Ever since the 1990s, none of these companies can be sued under Section 230. And so they have no duty of care for the toxicity on their platforms. Mm. And, and Congressman, you as well as the Surgeon General are calling this an emergency. So I wonder, do you have any confidence that Congress can agree to implement warning labels on social media? What are you hearing from your colleagues about implementing this and also a timeline for all of this? Congress hasn't passed a single piece of legislation related to data, to privacy, to algorithms until we led the charge out of the Select Committee on China to divest forcibly TikTok from Chinese party, Chinese Communist Party control. That, to me, is an important catalyst for taking seriously the imperative to regulate social media. We then saw that the two most senior lawmakers from the Committee of Jurisdiction wrote a bipartisan op-ed in the Wall Street Journal calling for the sunsetting of Section 230, which is this immunity shield for social media corporations. This is progress, but we now have to fill in this forward momentum with substantive policy. That's raising the age, that's getting rid of this liability protection. Yeah, well, th then in that, with that being said, do you really think something's gonna happen here? And also, do you think something more urgent, faster needs to be done? Ultimately, it's gonna take Congress. I I'm heartened to see the uh, state's attorneys general uh, filing a lawsuit collectively against Meta, for example, holding them accountable for harassment of, of young women on their platforms. This is This is all important. But at the end of the day, you've got trillion dollar corporations and they're up against parents. And it's an unfair fight and it takes an institution like Congress, it takes the force of federal law to truly make a level playing field so that screen time doesn't eat family time. Mm. I want to get your reaction on some news of the day as well. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dissolved his war cabinet earlier today. Your House colleague, Ro Khanna, told Peter Alexander on Meet the Press this Sunday that he won't be attending Netanyahu's address to Congress next month. What's your reaction to that? And is it a mistake by your progressive colleague to, to not go to that address? I'm not going to be taking attendance of, of my colleagues. They, they'll make up their own mind for what's best for them and their districts. What I would say is that Prime Minister Netanyahu needs to focus more on the Knesset and more on his own security cabinet than he does on the United States Congress. The United States Congress has appropriated more than $14 billion in security aid for his efforts in Gaza, which I support in the, uh, in the sense of we have to defeat Hamas and we have to get the hostages home. But the prime minister needs to also wring out consensus from his own government about a same-day governance plan for Gaza, because ultimately Hamas cannot be defeated unless there is an alternative. You can't fight something with nothing. Yeah. Uh, are you worried, though, that the war cabinet being dissolved, that it might make it more difficult to rein in Israel's military strategy here and even make it more difficult to get a ceasefire agreement? I do, although it's challenging to predict the vicissitudes of Israeli domestic politics or Middle Eastern dynamics. What I will say is that Prime Minister Netanyahu right now is more dependent upon, Prime, upon President Biden than he probably has been over the last three to six months. And that's going to give President Biden more leverage, I think, to get Netanyahu to offer same-day governance strategy for Gaza.
Mm. I want to ask you about the Biden campaign. It's focused on courting older voters ahead of November. Um, even if you see some erosion in, in for the Biden campaign for young voters, are you concerned that the president isn't doing enough to really shore up the constitu constituencies that helped him win in 2020? Uh, this election is going to come down to 200,000 voters in six counties. Every vote counts. I'm always skeptical of efforts to slice and dice the electorate and say which one matters more than the other. I think there's a couple of core messages that are going to resonate. One is that President Biden is trying to make this economy work for everybody. If that's older voters, he's talking about Medicare negotiating drug prices and capping out-of-pocket costs at $2,000 per year. Never been done before. Uh, if it's younger voters, he, he might focus more on his efforts to make housing uh, more affordable. But the common theme needs to be cost of living. And then the second one is going to be a contrast on law and order. <laughs> the Republican Party is trying to defund the FBI, voting against border security. They're nominating a convicted felon. And meanwhile, Joe Biden uh, has put rule of law and his respect for the integrity of the judicial system front and center. Well, we'll certainly be watching that debate uh, in 10 days to, to talk about all the things that you just laid out there. Uh, thank you so much, Congressman, for being here. Good evening. And we're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. News continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.